Why did you end up leaving Billboard? It was time, time, man. It was time. I mean, uh, I think in, in a retrospect, I probably left a year too late. I, the Death Ribbon Blues, which was a book I worked on really hard and put a lot of thought into through 85, 86, 87. The book came out sometime in 88. And um, it got really great reviews. Um, uh, and why I won some awards for it. And I really had poured in everything I had been learning in the last 10 years about the culture into that book. I, I became really uh, uh, connected to a lot of the old heads, particularly the old black radio guys, um, Jack Gibson, uh, Jack the Rapper, he had a big conference every year. Um, so many great music people, so many great musicians. So uh, a lot of the old heads, Old promotion men, uh, a guy named Joe Medlin, uh, late Joe Medlin, and the late Dave Clark. These guys really gave me an education in the culture. So the book was kind of a summation of all of. I kind of, I was kind of channeling their thoughts, quite honestly, about the journey of the music. Um, and then I kind of hung around Billboard for another year, even though I kind of was mentally checked out. I just was afraid at that point to leave because I'd been there, you know, my entire, basically adult life. Um, and so finally I said, okay, I, this book, The Death of the Blues, I have nothing, this is it. I, I've said what I had to say based on all these years of work and, you know, and it's time for me to move on because I'm not really motivated anymore. I don't, you know, so I kind of hung on for another year out of fear and then finally made the leap and left, I think that summer of 89. And it took me a, a couple of years to get my bearings. Uh, what was interesting uh, was I moved into a neighborhood in Brooklyn called Fort Greene. And um, I moved around the corner from a guy named Spike Lee, who at the time I moved in was, had done some short, had a, actually won a student Academy Award for a film. The reason we connected is he wanted to do music videos. And um, through a girl I met, we had lunch, and I tried to get Spike some music video work. And actually, uh, he did a, this is a great, if you can find it on the internet, I don't know if Spike might have pulled it down by now. He did a spec video of White Lines by Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel. It has Larry Fishburne in it. And he shot this thing, and he showed it to Sugar Hill. And apparently Sugar Hill used it without his permission, being Sugar Hill. And... Uh, <laughs> So he didn't really have any luck. He, I, I, I mean, he had meetings at Arista, I remember I got him. He just couldn't get a music video. And in cut two in 19, uh, was it 87, 86? She's Gonna Have It comes out. And then now everyone wants the Spike Walker Spike. Uh, but so, so when Spike broke through where She's Gonna Have It, it created another opportunity for, uh, for people like me who were interested in, in film. And so I ended up working on and writing, co-writing two films that got made amazingly, uh, both of which have a music connection. One was Strictly Business, which was a film with Halle Berry, the first big star in the role, Tommy Davis and the comedian. And it was actually partly the idea of a guy named Andre Harrell uh, of Uptown Records. And uh, so Andre sort of committed, he would do the soundtrack, um, I co-wrote the movie with a woman named Pam Gibson, who uh, was a music video producer at the time. And the movie actually is interesting because the soundtrack is, you know, Joe to see. Uh, it's Mary J. Blige's first song is on the Sick Creep Business soundtrack. Mm. Um, so there was a lot of energy going on between 
hip hop culture, New Jack Swing, and sort of the new black film movement that Spike had started. And then I worked, I ran into a guy named Chris Rock, who was, uh, again, the other young comedian starting out. He came to my house uh, with his idea for rap spinal taps, as he put it. Um, and I kind of was like, hey, whatever, kid. And uh, I tried to get rid of him, basically. <laughs> so I, I, I gave him a bunch of questions. Yeah, when you answer these, come back and you know, we'll work. Figuring how to never come back. Most times you ask someone to write something, they're never coming back. And he did it. And then that was probably, uh, when did we first meet? I'm thinking that's uh, 89 or 90. Um, and then in between time, Chris was in New Jack City, which, which was very successful. And he was great as Pookie, the, the crackhead, uh, which also had an amazing you know, New Jack Swing soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to get this movie CB4 made. We shot it in the summer of 82, right after the LA riot in Los Angeles. And it came out in March of 93. And so both of those things gave me the momentum to transition from the pure world of writing about music to, you know, other, other venues. You know, I never, I never knew I would be, a, you know, I kind of hoped that I'd, I'd be a screenwriter, but I didn't know how I was going to do that. And I think Spike's, Spike's example opened the doors. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and Spike, I mean, he's got such a strong thread with music throughout the years. I mean, all his films, or most of them, yeah. you know, Do the Right Thing and Jungle Fever and Girl Six and all the greats, Prince, Stevie Wonder and right. Public Enemy. and um, What a, a legacy there. But that was one of, you know, that's one of the ways that Spike and I connected because I, I ended up, he, I ended up had moved around the corner from him, literally, like, he, I, was, I lived on the good block, he lived on the bad block at the beginning. And um, he was really into music. And so, you know, it's so ironic because he wanted to be in music videos, couldn't get in. And then his music, his, his films are saturated in pop music, you know. And uh, he worked, as he said, worked with most of the, the greats uh, doing the butt song. School days, yeah. That's produced by Marcus Miller. That's right. So uh, he was able to work with all these great musicians, ironically, later. Um, so he's a, so I think it's also interesting because I've been very fortunate. And part of it had to do with geography. This neighborhood of Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, and Brooklyn. So Chris Rock moved in there. That's how we became friends. Spike lived there. Um, Lawrence Fishburne, Wesley Snipes, Rosie Perez. Also, Branford Marsalis and um, uh, Terrence Blanchard. Um, so there was this really interesting mix of Vernon Reed. This really mix of musicians, actors, songwriters. There were poets. There were designers. And this neighborhood sort of was um, sort of a black renaissance that went on from, I don't know, mid-'80s to like around 2000. Um, I even did a documentary. Uh, called the Brooklyn Boheme, which was about that this era. So I think that part of my career was nurtured by the fact that um, not only was I you know, trying to be a, a, a you know, young artist, but there were all these other people around me, like-minded individuals, some of whom I worked with, some of whom just became friends, but their presence was inspirational. And the idea that um, there were these possibilities. Spike was really important uh, in the sense that he had a very big vision that was very inter contagious. So when I first met him in, um, this is 80, I guess 86, 86, um, two things happened. I had done a book on Michael Jackson, which I mentioned. I've never had any money in my life. So I actually invested money in She's Gotta Have It, about uh, $3,000, which was a lot of money for me in 83, probably was a lot of money in 83. And uh, 80, and so he, I was an investor in the movie. And then um, I worked on a book with Spike, which is called um, Spike Lee's Got a Habit, which was, a, which is kind of like a film book, you know, an interview with Spike and a script from She's Got a Habit. And what was interesting in, about that is, um, when I met Spike, he was living in a little, little, small apartment in the bad part of the neighborhood. Just so, so the idea when I met him, the idea that Spike 
was living in his little apartment and make try to make this film. Then he goes, gonna, we're going to do a book about your film that no one, you don't even have a movie yet, dude. Uh, but his his sense of possibility was really amazing. And so everything that he kind of talked about in this little apartment in Brooklyn, he did. He got the movie made. He played Khan of all, you know, the Khan Film Festival with it. We did a book about the making of his uh, his film. He went on to do, you know, all these commercials with the character of, of uh, Mookie and uh, the character from uh, Mars Blackman was with Michael Jordan, because he was a huge Michael Jordan fan. I just, I, I, so he was a good example of the power of possibility. And no wonder he was always such a big Prince fan, too, because Prince was that way also, I think. Yeah, the two of them really, and they got along very well. That, that idea that um, we, we believe our talent is such that we can do things that no one else could think was, at the time, was impossible. Young black musicians, the young black filmmakers, didn't, they, they didn't exist, they didn't proliferate. Uh, the black musicians didn't get movies made about them. You know, uh, and they both had that belief that they could do it. Uh, and they did it, and they opened doors, not necessarily just for us, but in terms of how you thought about what was possible. Mm -hmm. I think that that really, uh, the biggest influence that I know that Spike had on me mm -hmm. was the idea that, um, oh, well, you want to direct? I can direct. You want to write movies? You want to make documentaries? The fact that, you, that these things were possible um, if you just asked for them, in a sense. You had to work for them, but you had to really make that decision to go for it. And I think that's something that Spike really uh, opened up in me. The Death of Rhythm and Blues, so I got to say, I mean, that book to me is a landmark book and when it came out it expressed so many of the things that I was kind of thinking about too is you know I looked at a lot of the um, you know R&B funk guys that went to pop as sort of like selling out you know and uh, you know kind of giving in to the big machine of the of the corporate music industry and so I think it's very important uh, work and it and it really um, spoke to people like myself so well, that was a so that, that book is definitely a, a byproduct of, of my years at Billboard. Um, I wanted, I did the book of Motown because I'd always been obsessed with Motown as a child. But in the course of doing that book, the larger question of what was going on with my music was, came up. And um, I would go to this, the Jack the Rapper conference, which was in Atlanta every year. And I would meet, you know, a lot of the old heads who, who guys who went back, I mean, I'd meet guys who went back to the days of the, the big bands. You know, a lot of promotion guys had been musicians. The guys I'd meet who were now in their, at that point, probably in their late 50s, early 60s, were guys who, some were young men during uh, big band. They went through the blues, they went through the war, both, you know, World War One. World War One. Um, they saw the transition into R&B. Uh, and this kind of world, I call it the R&B world of, of Venues like the Apollo, uh, Black Radio, um, Touring Circuit, the retail outlets, you know, that had the speakers on the sidewalk. These guys were, were all of that. And they began saying to me that it was, it was slowly ebbing away and was being taken control of. It. What had been sort of an ad hoc world and a very somewhat closed world based, you know, because of segregation as well. Um, was being taken over by CBS, Warner Brothers, RCA. And it was changing the way the music was being made to accommodate these corporate mandates. And that became my thesis. Um, one of the things that really, really sort of crystallized that was a document called the uh, Harvard Report, which was a report I'd never heard of that was given to me by um, one, of the, one of those old head guys gave it to me in the mid 80s. And it was a report done in the early 70s by uh, Harvard University Business School, commissioned by CBS Records. It's sort of how, if we want to get involved in black music in a big way, which they did, how do we do it? And it laid out a blueprint, which basically was what not only CBS, but Warner Brothers, Polygram, RCA, Mercury, uh, all of the big players at the time kind of did in terms of uh, recruiting talent from the both the artists as well as the 
uh, A and R and executive talent from Motown, Stax, Atlantic, the big uh, indie black R and B R and B label, radio, and uh, it laid out a blueprint. And the blueprint, even if I don't know if it was just an obvious blueprint, but that's what happened. What was in that report is what happened to black music in the '70s and the '80s. And these guys were very uh, aware that that would that not. It wasn't simply that the the music was changing as it always does, but that it wasn't changing organically. Mm. Was one of their beefs. Um, and so I mean, records like um, uh, what's a good example? Disco Lady by Johnny Taylor. Johnny Taylor's Disco Lady was a mammoth hit record. Uh, but after he did that, it never really came back. It was kind of a strange way to end of Johnny Taylor's career. And a lot of the art, and at least he had a hit. There were other artists. People forget Aretha made an album called La Diva. I think it was in 78 or 79. It's the worst album of her career. And the worst selling album of her career. And it, it wasn't until Clive Davis brought her to Arister a couple of years later that she kind of revived. Yeah, Free Me of Love. Yeah, uh, but she had she had some people forget she had a two or three years where it was really she had really fallen off the cliff as a, as a recording artist and she could easily hit had not that next wave solidified her as a great American icon but without that next wave there's a lot of people who didn't have a next wave people like Tyrone Davis or Johnny Taylor or there were so many artists who who were pushed to go pop or pushed to go disco which were, were considered kind of the same thing and never recovered lost a lot of connection to their audience as, as, as a result. Um, so the book deal dealt with all of that stuff, those ideas. Um, and I tried, because I, I really hadn't read a history of the music that dealt with black radio and black retail as part of this thing. Everyone kind of writes about, what was writing about it as the label and the artist. But it, it became very clear to me that there was an infrastructure, uh, a culture, of, of uh, clubs, venues, radio, retail, that were all connected. And you couldn't really write about one without writing about the other. Absolutely. And then later on, you did the uh, uh, Finding the Funk. Yeah, Finding the Funk, that was a, uh, that's something that, uh, yeah, I, I just like funk music is, is a ball headed stepchild of, of, of pop music. Uh, there's, there's been tons of writing about disco as a phenomenon, mini docs. Hip hop has tons. Soul music has tons. Funk is still relatively under written about. So I, I, I did that doc for, with VH1. I also worked on uh, Tales in the Tour Bus with Mike Judd. Okay. Judd. Judge. Judge. Mike Judd, excuse me, Mike. Uh, last, the, we did a whole year on funk, which was great. We did James Brown, Bootsy, Rick James, Betty Davis, Morris Day. So that was fun. And that's, to me, it was a continuation of finding the funk in a sense, of trying to make the funk story up there. Uh, I've been having a hell of a time trying to put the doc online. because I was of, looking for it, yeah. What is the issue with one of the, there's a piece of music, there's actually a, a, a piece of interview that belongs to VH1 that I, I've been trying to clear for like five years. Uh, and we haven't been able to get it. So I've, I've been stuck because it's a, it's a James Brown section of the thing that I really feel like I need to have. Um, so it's held up me being able to re-release it. Hopefully this this year, though obviously the virus thing has stopped my, you know, all the, we, we had a whole negotiation going on and then boom. So hopefully by the end of the year, I'll get it back out. I feel like that sort of represents the journey of funk in general. You know, I mean, it's always sort of like gotten pushed to the side a little bit, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and it's uh, got to stop, you know, you know, George has had his ongoing battles with uh, people at uh, West Brown, Best Bound Records, you know, the Funk Bella catalog. It's really strange. Funk is the, it's the backbone of hip hop. Absolutely. No one argues with that. But it's none of the people there. People don't know Maurice White, but they know Jay-Z. Uh, they only kind of know Rick James because of his scandal in a sense. Mm. Um Betty Davis. I mean, there's so many great bands, you know, Cameo, uh, just on and on and on. And Dyke and the Blazer, they think all these great bands. But they're not, they're not given the same respect as a, a, an artist on Stax Records 
you know, who Sam and Dave or, 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 or Martha Reeves, everyone kind of has it. So like, something happened, some disconnect happened with pop culture in terms of funk. And it's never um, gotten its due. So, I mean, I, I, tried to, I tried to do a funk movie that I had set up at one studio, couldn't get that made. So I've been trying my damnness to, to, to get it out there. So we'll, we'll keep pushing. A funk uh, movie that had a storyline or a documentary? Yeah, yeah, movie, movie, a movie, movie, but uh -huh. based on based on funk music. Yeah, that'd be. And I know other friends have tried to get funk music movies made, and it just hasn't been able. You know, we just haven't haven't been able to get past the gatekeepers. And what's weird about that too, to me, is that the music itself has infiltrated into mainstream culture so much and influenced so much of it, but the genre itself has still struggled. Yeah, it it, it still does. I mean. I was, you know, the Bruno Mars Uptown Funk was great and uh, important. And it put funk, it's interesting because funk as a word is back in pop culture. Um, I think Bruno Mars has reckoned had a big impact on that. I, a lot of, you know, you'll find a lot of young bands that play funk. And if you go in the jam band scene, a lot of what those bands play is, is funk. So it's not, it hasn't disappeared by any means. Thank goodness. It's just, uh, it, it, it's just not, it's kind of back being, an un, it's almost underground music again. Uh, in the sense that it's there, but it's not, it's not there in the sense the way that, there's no big Motown special about funk. It is no, because funk also was, was, was kind of chaotic music in the sense it wasn't, it was kind of wild. It's wild, psychedelic black folks. Mm -hmm. It was crazy here singing about spaceships. Uh, and maybe that wasn't something that America could easily digest. But even now when you go to the uh, George Clinton shows and it's predominantly white crowds, right? but still it's sort of underground in some kind of way. I mentioned, you know, George Clinton to like my son's friends in the area we live in. And right. a lot of them are like, who? You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, they've listened to his, they've heard his music many times. So funk is definitely the, I don't know. I mean, when we did that last season, uh, the, the Tales from the Tour Bus, um, you know, we turned a lot of people on and we're hoping to do, you know, I'm hoping to, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to continue to push forward with Funk's journey and keep pushing forward. So we'll see what happens. What was the biggest um, unexpected thing you encountered in, in putting that documentary together, would you say? Oh, uh, uh, I think that the, the biggest contribution in the way of the, of the doc, I don't know, was, was the section on Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I remember I have an article from Billboard, from Record World, from um, the, the charts are alive with the sound of Dayton. This is from, 19, this is from 1981 in Record World. And I, that's the first time I got turned on to March 21st, 1981, right? It took me another 25 years or whatever to actually get the Finding the Funk doc and to go to Dayton to shoot that world because Slave, Ohio Players, Lakeside, um, Sign. Boot, yeah. Zap, Zap. Uh, Zap. Faso, um, what's a great musician I'm drifting blank on who played with uh, Judy Morrison? Ohio Players, yeah. Yeah, and then P Funk. I mean, it was amazing how many. Uh, artists came out of that town. And so being able to go to Dayton and to shoot in Dayton was really a, uh, you know, it go, I mean, I, the doc came out and then, you know, uh, what year was that? Around 2010, 2011. I, I've been writing about Dayton since 81. So to finally be able to, to document that and to put Dayton on the map, and, and that, you know, as the center of funk was really helpful. And that is, that is a funk museum there. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, it took them a long time to understand the city itself, to understand what they had. They should have been promoting Dayton funk for a long time. Mm. Um, that's funk. It, 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 it's there, but it's not there. <laughs> so I noticed on a lot of your, your film credits, your producer, exact producer in some cases, what is your role typically as it pertains to films? Each, each uh, project's different. Um, you know, on uh, Tales of the Tour Bus, I helped select the artists 
and help recruit the artists, which was very important. Trying to get George, George Clinton uh, was kind of the ambassador for the show. So recruiting George and then reaching out to Bootsy, um, so making some of the, those connections. And then uh, helping guide the storytelling in terms of, you know, you need to be this person, you that person. Uh, but on a thing like uh, I worked on um, Top 5, a movie with Chris Rock, that's more uh, advising in the script, um, being a, a set of uh, creative ears for Chris while he's on set. So each, I think each one of these projects is different. On, on the Ballerina's Tale, I made a documentary about the ballerina, Mr. Copeland. I was the director. I shot a lot of it, of it. so that was much more hands-on. I don't. It's funny about producing. Uh, there are certain things you do often, but there's, each project requires different things. So it's it's a, it's really much about being very flexible um, and seeing what the project requires. Whether I need to be a very forceful creative force, or am I just there to, to help it, whatever team I'm working with make it happen? Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting thing, and it's. It's not one job, it's a number of different jobs, and each one's different from each project. Hmm. On the writing side, what made you decide to you know, go into some fiction? Oh, I just always wanted to write fiction. Um, and I do these char- I do these series of books, um, they're called the D. Hunter series. And I've done about, the, the fifth one will be coming out in August, I think. And they're all these kind of musical detective stories, basically. These guys, D. Hunter's a bodyguard for artists, uh, and each one, someone tries to kidnap an artist and one, the accidental hunter. Uh, the most popular book was called The, uh, the Plot Against Hip Hop, where uh, a friend of his gets murdered and it leads into a, a sort of a conspiracy against hip hop. Um, so each one is driven by this idea that the musical culture is a nocturnal culture. It's a good, it's a good environment for mystery and intrigue. Uh, and so it's been fun. I'm, I've done, this has been my fifth book. This, this fifth one's called uh, The Darkest Hearts, and that'll be out in August on Akashic Books. And uh, so it's just, to me, it's just a chance to take some stories that may not fit into any of the non, into the nonfiction books and put them into a novel. In general, how do you get your, your ideas and where's your inspiration come from? And, and I know it's a lot of questions in one, but how, how, and how long does it t- typically take you to like do a project like a book? That depends on the book. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, the novels are very much driven by finding the right plot engine. You know, like any, any you know, what's the inciting incident? What is the destination? What are the obstacles to solving this mystery? Uh, nonfiction, obviously, is more... Uh, I'm working on a book now, actually. I'm doing a, a coronavirus book because I'm home. I was going to ask that, yeah. And... Um, this one is really about creativity. It's more stories about creative people I've met and, and some of the lessons I've learned. So um, actually, I'm going to go, as soon as we finish, I'm going to start working on a section about the, the Motown book. And uh, the two things about that book that sort of, I was thinking about, how did that book come together? One was going to Detroit and interviewing the old, especially the studio musicians, the Funk Brothers. They were the guys who were the low mid the low men of the totem pole at Motown. And because of that, they were always looking up at the structure. And uh, so having all these stories and access to the Funk Brothers. And then I read a book called Corporate Culture, which was a book about how corporations have a sort of way that they begin moving and how they, the culture of the company begins being shaped. So the idea that I was looking at Motown as this institution not just the music business, but how did it how did it work as a build in, within the building, and then having this whole group of storytellers who were in the basement. So that book kind of was a product of those two ideas coming together. So I mean, you know, each book then is um, catalyzed by your access. Who's going to tell your story? Who can who can help you tell the story? And then what is the thematic structure that that story is poured into? You had mentioned, you know, a thrill being seeing the victory tours and, and the Jacksons and all that. And you wrote the book on Michael and then later wrote another book, I think, after he passed. Right. Um, did you meet him? Did you spend time with Michael at all? Not a lot. A, a little bit uh, back in the early days. I actually spent more time with the family. 
I got to know Catherine, Joe. I had a lot of interactions with Jermaine. Um, and then a lot of the people around them. Uh, Quincy, I got to know very well. And a lot of musicians who played on all those records. Great filling game, uh, and, you know, great keyboard player. So uh, that was more like, a, it was, you know, Michael Jackson had just a sad story in that he had this incredible success and then he had all these uh, demons around him. I mean, both, both his own personal demons and that of literally people around him who were very unscrupulous. Um, someone said to me uh, when I was researching one of the books, Michael Jackson never gets a deal. And what he meant is that every time he shows up, whoever he deals with charges three times what they usually would charge. And, um, his, you know, he, that he, he's a good example of when you give an incredible success, there's another side, there's another side to that success. And uh, success is your own personal demons get unleashed. The success is that other people see you as someone to be uh, exploited. And uh, you have to really, your idea of what, who you can trust really becomes very warped. I think all of those things uh, are manifest in his story. Um, so I, one thing I always say to people, you, you, you want to be successful, you may not want to be famous. Because mm -hmm. uh, the people I've seen who, who dealt with fame, very few of them have dealt with it in a, a way that's really healthy. Because it, it, warps your, it warps your world like nothing else. Yeah. How do you stay grounded? I'm not famous, man. <laughs> I'm not rich either, though. But... Uh, you know, I, I'm very happy with the career that, 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 that I made, man. Um, it's, I look back on it now, I'm like, you know, uh, it's just, I, mean, I can't believe that I got those books done. Because I, I feel like that was such a, it was very much, you know, when you work on film, I do mostly film and TV now, there's a whole team of people helping you. There's a whole network of people. When you sit down and do these books, you know, back then there was no internet either. So I'm, you know, I'm spending a lot of time at libraries, um, old newspapers, you know, there's a lot of like, you really had to physically dig. You had to go to, uh, so, I mean, the Motown book, a lot of the Motown book was made going to the courthouse in Detroit and, and just going, okay, how many lawsuits was, you know, Motown involved in? And you'd go in and you'd ask for the public record and then they would come out on this it wasn't even paper. It was like this kind of fax paper that you would get these, you know, huge lawsuits. But so much detail was in these lawsuits, in the discovery. So um, I just, in fact, uh, one point I had to, I gave away the files to a music, to, uh, to the University of Indiana has a black music archive. So I gave all my Motown and all my different and blue stuff to them because literally it had taken over my house. You know, so uh, that same, I wouldn't nearly have to do the same amount of, of um, you know, that kind of labor. It's a different kind of labor now writing a book. But it was also an adventure because you physically had to go everywhere. There were very few places you, you know, and it wasn't a really big black music archives. Then. You had to go to Detroit to the newspaper. To the, you had to go to the courthouse. You had to go to the library. So it was very labor intensive. I don't know if I, I look back, I was glad I was in my 20s and 30s. I don't yeah. know if I could could do that now. I think a lot of us look back decades ago and we're like, well, no way can I do that now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What 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 if um if it comes to mind easily, what would you say your top five albums of all time? What are your five favorites? Um uh, Blood of the Tracks by Bob Dylan. Uh I kind of find that's the way of the world, Earth and Fire. Individions, Stevie Wonder. Takes a Nation of Millions, Earth, uh, Public Enemy. And um, probably, uh, I'm trying to figure out which Aretha Franklin album. Uh, you know, actually, I would I would probably take, actually, uh, it's between Aretha and Sade's Love Deluxe. I, I'd probably take Sade's Love Deluxe. 
even though Aretha is a greater artist, is an album that the, the Shawnees Love Deluxe is my favorite album. I play it all the time. Wow, some good picks. I'm right with you. That's my favorite Stevie Wonder album for sure. A lot of people say songs in the key of life, but I go for inner visions. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, so what do you have on deck here? You talked about a book that you're still uh, working on, and, and what else uh, should we be on the lookout for? Uh, what's the next thing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, this Tupac doc, I'm, I'm part of a team that's working on a five-part Tupac documentary for FX. That, But that won't be ready until next year. You know, obviously the virus is, we're not going to be able to go out and do a bunch of interviews any, you know, anytime soon, which was, we were planning on. So, I, you know, that, that'll probably be the next, oh, what am I saying? Well, I have a book out. <laughs> I should just talk about this. The Nelson George Mixtape, Volume 1. It's available through Pacific Publishers. Pub, if you go online, Pacific underscore Pacific dot pub. And it's a collection of my writings from 1977 to 93. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about is in there. Um, the Prince Art interview, there's a big article about the Motown musician, with the Motown musicians that I wrote for uh, Musician Magazine. That was actually the precursor to the Motown book. There's a Marvin Gaye interview. There's a Quincy Jones, Whitney. Um, there's also a bigger interview with Grandmaster Flash Cool Herc and After Mambata, which is I did for the Source magazine in '93, which may be I believe is the only interview that all three of those guys have done together ever. Um, so that's a big, you know, I'm still promoting that the Nelson George mixtape volume one, and um, yeah, I, I mean, we should just talk. That's that's like current that's happening now. Um, so if people are interested in, in following up on the stuff we've talked about, a lot of it is in this book. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Nelson, thank you so much for sharing these stories and your your varied career, and I wish you so much more success. All right, man. Thank you. So, uh, you know, let me know when this is coming out. I will. All okay, right. Bro. Be safe. Well. All right. Take care. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube, go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing all coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the FunkinStuff.net website, and on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also drop me a line, email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show the true music lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.